Hello everyone and welcome to lecture two of this intro to earth science uh, block. Uh, this one is going to be all about how geoscience relates to us and how we are integrally bound to the earth and earth science as a whole. There's a famous quote by Will Durant in the 1800s that goes, civilization exists by geological consent, subject to change without notice. This means our society exists purely because the Earth's current environment allows it to be so, and there are natural forces at work that could change that dramatically uh, with no warning, to make it such that the Earth is no longer a nice place for humanity to exist. So that's what this lecture is going to be. It's going to be looking back in time to the links between humanity and our development as a species and geoscience and advances in our ability to use the world's resources um, and use the world around us to build bigger and better and more wonderful technologies. It's looking at the present where our current development has got to the point where we've developed so much that we are now causing ourselves uh, and the environment problems and, the f and looking then to the future at how geoscience and earth science can help remedy those problems that earth science has generated by our in by increasing our ability to use the earth's environment um, and so i want to go right back to the dawn of civilization which is also the dawn of earth science as a whole even to the point that the way we name time periods, uh, the first few time periods of Earth history are named after natural resources, starting with the Stone Age. Now, this uh, was a time period that lasted around 3.4 million years. And the key thing that happened is we learned how to use rocks. We found a couple of rocks, bashed them together to make a tool that could either cut things or make, bend other things into shape. This made things substantially easier for us. It made hunting easier, it made building a camp easier, it made building livelihoods easier. And this is really the sort of like dawn of society as a whole, where we moved from that hunter gatherer stage into a more societal regime, basically because we learned how to use rocks. Um, this period ended around 800 BC when we got even better at using rocks. But it's not just our ability to start using rocks that shaped this time period. It was also the climate and how it changed. So this is a graphic about the distribution of early humans. So at the beginning, we're all stuck here in Africa and we can't get out because the Sahara Desert provides an impenetrable blockade. But very, very small fluctuations in warming and cooling occasionally allow the Sahara to be crossed like now which allows humans to migrate into Saudi Arabia, Europe, India, Southeast Asia. And then the climate warms up again and that barrier comes into place again across the Sahara. Pulses of this allowed early humans to migrate out of Africa across the, to the rest of Europe. And then subsequent slightly warming periods eventually allowed our ancestors to transverse a uh, land bridge between uh, what is now Russia and North America right about now to start colonizing and uh, settling in the Americas and down to South America. And so our current distribution is intrinsically linked to climate fluctuations. Uh, if the climate had never cooled enough that the Sahara became traversable, we would never have got out of Africa. If it never rewarmed after that, Early humans would have never got into America. The next time period uh, after the Stone Age is the Bronze Age. And it's essentially, uh, we are getting better at utilizing Earth's resources. We're able to extract metals from rocks, specifically copper and tin to make bronze. Uh, bronze is really important for us because it is much better to make tools out of than stone is. We can start making more complicated instruments. And this period went between 600 to 300 BC, and it only ended when we got even better at using materials, the Iron Age. This started around 1200 BC and is essentially 
coincides with when we started being able to extract iron from rocks. This allowed us to make things like steel, which is iron and carbon, and even better tools. And from here, society just really goes from strength to strength uh, without much more technological development. But we're starting to see cities, civilizations, empires rise and fall um, because we essentially have more time to do other things. Uh, like we're not continuously fighting for our own survival. We're now able to start talking to each other, both in politics, both in arts. And so the next big shift is really when we get even better at doing stuff uh, with these materials and develop new technologies. And that jumps us ahead a, a few thousand years to the Industrial Age. Uh, this is around seven, the 1700s, and it ended uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and this was fueled by our ability to use coal. Coal is a combustible. Uh, we were able to burn it uh, to heat up water to produce steam. That allowed us to generate the steam engine. And suddenly we didn't have to worry about wind to transfer around the globe. So transport became much quicker. We didn't have to worry about horses and carts to get us around. We could build trains. So land transport got really quicker. So it sort of started bringing the world together and interconnecting it in brand new ways. We were able to develop power tools to build things faster and more efficiently, and as well as dramatic increases in life expectancy because we could start having things that we take for granted now, like running water. So the quality of human life has increased dramatically over this time period. We now live twice as long as we did pre the industrial age. The slight wrinkle in this is starting to burn all this coal, has pumped a whole load of pollution and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is exactly when humans have started to affect the climate. It's during this time that the birth of modern geology occurs where we start looking at the Earth system in a scientific, systematic way to try and understand it, it's to under, understand how it works and understand its resources. Similar to this is the age of oil, which uh, started around 1901 and is current, we're currently still in the age of oil. And that's essentially our ability to extract oil and burn it, change it, utilize it. And essentially our entire society relies on this resource right now. We hope that will end soon um, because as we're about to see, there are a lot of problems associated with burning petroleum. But if you look around you, kind of like we showed in the first lecture, everything about our society relies on oil, from plastics to energy to fuel. While the industrial period brought us geology, the age of oil was the birth of earth science as a proper discipline. I also want to go into a little nice story because oil gets a bit of a bad rap uh, for very justifiable reasons. Uh, but there's one really nice story right at the beginning that people aren't necessarily aware of, and it saved the sperm whale. So there's great stories like Moby Dick about these people that would hunt sperm whales, essentially because they had these sacks inside them that are full of oil that people used for lamps. And they were hunted nearly to extinction in these quite dramatic things called a Nantucket sleigh ride, where humans would throw a harpoon into the sperm whale win a little dinghy and then hold on for dear life as it took them on a merry ride around the ocean until the poor thing died they were then able to uh, extract this oil that people were using for lamps all around the world and as i said these things nearly these beautiful creatures nearly went extinct and would have done so if it wasn't for our sudden new ability to use crude oil and petroleum to do the same function as the oil within, within the sperm whales. So while sperm whale numbers, have uh, they're still quite low compared to what they were, the recovery of the sperm whale population from the edge of extinction can be put at the doorstep of our newfound ability to use oil.